All right, well, so second to last week on this series, I appreciate you all joining for this. Uh, it's been encouraging to get the feedback and the interest uh, in the subject. I hope to do this again sometime. I have learned so much as I've been going through this, and my, my reading list has grown. I've got several hundred pages in my office now, two new books have come in that I haven't even read yet on subjects related to this series. So I'm hoping to study more, read more, and come back and reboot this series again at some point. But um, ask for some feedback. Next week I'll have a survey for you guys to fill out. We'd appreciate some feedback on what was helpful and just getting some what could be, be better and just some insights on the future. If we do this again, some feedback on, on how on that would be helpful. So let me pray and we'll, we'll dive in. Father, we thank you for giving us the word and I pray that um, for those who are considering the claims of Christianity, God, that you'd help me to explain things faithfully and clearly and that you would uh, just reveal yourself. And God, for those who have who already know Christ, I pray, God, again, that this would be encouraging. I pray it would be helpful, it would be edifying, that it would equip uh, believers to better understand how they got the Bible in their hands and be able to explain that to others who have questions or misconceptions. And to be able to, to make a case for Christianity uh, to, to others, God. And so uh, I pray that the results of what we learned today would unify us and would be helpful, God. Help me to explain things faithfully and clearly. Um, and Lord, I pray anything that's inaccurate that that would be for God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, uh, so Bible translation of the King James Controversy. So these things really tie in with last week. I think everybody was here last week or watched last week, so... That the whole textual transmission process and textual criticism is essential to understanding this question about modern Bible translations and specifically the King James only controversy. Just out of curiosity, who has who has been exposed to that in some shape or form? The King James only controversy. Somebody claiming the King James is the only Bible for about half the year. Okay, so uh, that subject is particularly near and dear to my heart for personal reasons. I'll explain that when we get a little bit into that. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so one of the most awful myths out there, so we, we covered probably the most popular awful myth last week, you know, the, 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 the translate or the transmission of the Bible is like the game of telephone, right? And they all say that's no, it's wrong, it's terrible, bad, um, that's just awful, that's not what happened. Uh, so another terrible myth out there is this one, the Bible has been translated so many times that it can't be trusted. And who's, who's heard this? Okay, a few of you. Uh, this came up in the Bill Nye Ken Ham debate. Bill Nye said this. Um, Bill Nye obviously is a very smart guy, but also very ignorant. And I don't mean that in insulting. We're all we all have areas of ignorance, but just ignorant in terms of the Bible. Um, he didn't even seem to recognize there were genres in the Bible. But he he made a comment about this. Um, Mark Ward talked about how his dental hygienist made this comment, and he was able to somehow ex refute it, even with cotton and stuff stuffed in his mouth. Uh, but this is one of the biggest myths uh, that the Bible's been translated so many times it can't be trusted. Uh, rather, next slide, that, you know, when we, when we translate the Bible, we don't, it's not just based on the latest copy that was made before. We're going back to all the manuscripts we have. We looked at that last week. We have like, over 5,000 word manuscripts, and, and we're looking at all of those. We're looking at the early translations, and uh, yes, we do take into account previous English translations, whether it's for style or interpretive decisions. Translations are not usually done in a vacuum, but each translation, can, again, goes back to the Hebrew, the Aramaic, the Greek. Uh, it's not simply a, a, a recopying of the latest English translation. So that's really a misunderstanding of how Bible translation works. Um, now, why do we have so many translations? And unfortunately, for some people, again, this seems to be evidence that the Bible's not reliable, right? I mean, why, if it's reliable, why why do we have so many translations? Uh, isn't that an indicator that, that there's a lot of confusion and we don't really know what the Bible message says? Um, so let's talk about that a little bit here. So first off, language evolves over time. Uh, this is why we all struggle so badly with Shakespeare, right? It's not because we're idiots. It's not because um, it, that Shakespeare was writing to a special, you know, some sort of subgroup of people that, you know, some hair, you know, high and mighty people. It's just language changes over time. Uh, language is a constantly um, moving target, if you will. You know, we're always translating into a target language, but the target's always moving. Language changes over time. And 
Uh, so it's necessary to, to do new Bible translations. Some have commented that probably about every 30 years is when we're due for a new English translation just as language evolves and changes. Uh, another reason we have so many translations is because there's different philosophies of translation. Uh, there's the formal or word for word or literal translation philosophy, and then there's the dynamic equivalent, which is more of a thought for thought. Um, and so there's different translations you're coming to, different philosophies you're coming to, also different audiences. If are you are you trying to translate the Bible so you know elementary students can read it uh, or not? You know what's your reading level that you're targeting? And finally, there's translation decisions to make. Um, that there's various words that can be translated uh, in different different ways. Uh, words have a range of meaning. This is true in every language, certainly in, in the English language, but in other languages as well. Words have a range of meaning. Um, you know, should I translate this word can or bucket? Well, I don't know. They might both work. You know, so there's a range of meaning. Um, phrases again. There's different ways to translate that, and sometimes they're just there's translation decisions to make. Uh, and I'll, I'll give an example of that here in a second. Um, all right, thanks. Uh, so just an example. So if you, how many of you have studied a foreign language in some shape or form? Alex, I think you have definitely studied. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so let me give you an example from French, okay? So there's an expression in French, j'ai le cafard. Uh, so now how do we translate that? So you're, my, you know, you're, you're translating for the French ambassador um, uh, in the middle of a, of a meeting, and he, and he says this expression, and okay, how are you going to translate it for somebody? Well, literally, word for word, translation, this would mean, I have the cockroach. Um, but he doesn't mean that he has a bug infestation problem. When a, when a French person says, I have the cockroach, they don't mean, okay, time to call the, the, uh, you know, the bug man. No, what they mean is they're depressed. They, um, and so that they're, they're feeling blue. So how do you translate it? So a literal translation would be, I have the cockroach. Um, a dynamic equivalent translation would be, I've got the blues. I'm depressed. I'm down in the dumps. Those are all thought for thought translations. So which translation is right? Well, they all are, in one sense. Uh, so it depends, again, on your target audience. If you have no understanding of French idioms, and I just tell you, I have the cockroach, I really, and maybe I, you can say, well, he mistranslated it for me, because yes, you told me what he said word for word, but I don't understand a word he, I don't understand the meaning of what he said. In fact, I have misunderstood it. I think he has a bug problem, not that he's talking about his emotional state. So you could argue that, uh, that that's a mistranslation. So, and so the same thing happens in, in Greek and Hebrew, and so translators have to make decisions. Do they give us a literal translation, and then they put a little footnote, right, saying the, you know, the, the French idiom, I have the cockroach, means, or do they just you know, put, I've got the blues, I'm depressed, I'm down in the dumps. Um, so just an example, so when you're translating, you always have to make decisions. Um, that's, and any of you guys who have had experience in other languages uh, probably are more familiar with that. All right, next, uh, also, and sometimes, sometimes people think, oh, if I just knew Hebrew, if I just knew Greek, then I would, everything would be clear. Uh, we, <laughs> I wish it were so. Now, it is helpful to learn the original languages, and um, for some people, it's, it's, it's worth putting the time in, especially if you're a pastor or a teacher, it's worth putting the time in to learn original languages. There's, it's, you can gain a lot of insights that way. But learning the original languages don't remove all your difficulties. Uh, look at Acts 20, 28. So you've got the English Standard Version and the Net, the New English Translation. And notice how they've translated this last phrase differently. So they're talking about um, that the, the church of God, which he, God, obtained with his own blood. Whereas the, the Net translates it, that God obtained with the blood of his own son. Well, which is accurate? Well, they're both possible. Um, now, the word son is not in the Greek. The Net is adding that. Because to, to clarify, because there's two ways you can translate this. Uh, the genitive that's here, is it, it can either be with his own blood, or it could be the blood of his own, his own son. And, you know, the, the implication being son, those are both valid translations. But knowing the Greek does not solve that problem for you. It is a translation decision. Uh, next slide. The Net Bible, if you're not familiar with the Net Bible, <laughs> it has more notes in it than it does Bible. Uh, and so... It's not my favorite translation in terms of reading or, or memorizing out of, and I don't always agree with the translation decisions, but it is really interesting and helpful for getting kind of behind the scene look at, because they put so many notes in there trying to explain translation decisions. And so the net comments, uh, the Greek with the, is literally with the blood of his own uh, or with his own blood. The genitive construction could be taken in two ways, as an attributive genitive, 
meaning his own blood, or as a possessive gender with the blood of his own. In this case, the referent is the son, and the referent has been added, uh, has been specified in the translation for clarity. So, again, there's translation decisions that have to be made. So that's why we have one of the reasons we have different Bible translations. And, we'll, and we're gonna, if you're asking well, which one's the best translation, we'll get to that at the end. We'll talk about that. All right. So the King James only controversy. Uh, so there's two. There's really two questions that, that that can be broken down into two camps. So there's a spectrum here. Okay. So one would say, and the first question is, is the King James the best English translation uh, uh, for style or wording or clarity, or whatever, or the, whatever your reasoning? But it basically, you know, is it the best English Bible? The second question is, are modern Bibles corrupted? And that really goes back to the question of, are they based on inferior Greek manuscripts? Um, we have a lot more manuscripts available today than when the King James was translated. Uh, the, the King James translators had access to relatively few manuscripts when they were translating, and so we have a lot more today. And some would claim, well, those are inferior manuscripts. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be using them. So we'll try to talk about this. Uh, in detail. This is a subject that's dear to my heart because before I ever went to uh, to grad school and really knew much, uh, somebody loaned me a copy of the uh, New Age Bible version by Gail Ripplinger. And uh, I happened to be living overseas at the time, so I didn't really have access to a lot of scholarship, but I didn't really know who to ask, where to ask. And Gail Ripplinger makes this huge, this big conspiracy theory argument. The Bible's been corrupted, modern English translations uh, have been corrupted, there's this New Age satanic scheme to uh, to corrupt the Bible, big time conspiracy theory, and it felt like a spiritual earthquake as I read this book, because I'm like, what? I can't I can't trust my, my New International Version, I can't trust my New American Standard, and for a time, I started going into the King James, reading the King James, memorizing the King James, uh, and I came to really realize that, find out that she really heard a lot of half-truths in her book, um, bad scholarship. Uh, and just that she wasn't even qualified. She, you know, they talked in the back of the book like, oh, she has a you know a, a master's degree from Yale. But I found out, yes, she does have a master's degree from Yale, but it's in like home economics. Uh, she didn't even know Greek, uh, and so I was like, you have no qualifications to talk about the things you're you're um, espousing here. So, uh, so anyway, I want to address this because this this question comes up: the King James Holy Controversy. Um, uh, and, and still, again, many people today believe King James is the, the best or the only Bible. And I want to talk about. Why that's good and why that's bad. So first off, why it's good. So there's benefits. So for hundreds of years, the King James basically dominated the marketplace in terms of English Bible translations. There were other translations that came after the KJV, like the Authorized Version, which I think was like 1901, uh, the Revised Standard Version. Uh, so there were other translations, but by and far, for hundreds of years, the King James Bible dominated Christendom in, in, in the English-speaking world. And there was something beautiful about that, that it unified Christians. There was, you know, it didn't really matter which denomination you were a part of or <clears throat> where you were. There was this unity that we were all using the same Bible. And that, that was a, a unifying thing. It was, that was a good thing. Um, and for outsiders, outside of the Christian faith, it probably led to an increased perception of the reliability of Scripture. Well, there's one translation, so it, you know, it makes it reliable. Again, there's this misperception today. Um, that be, the reason we have so many translations, even one uh, famous atheist comments on this about how all the the different Bibles out there, and they miss that. Like if you go to the, if you go to a Bible bookstore, I mean you can find like you know the Policeman's Bible, Study Bible, or you know, like the the Patriot Study Bible. Like there's all these different, and but those what what most people don't realize is, or outside of Christianity at least don't realize is those are. Those are editions, not translations, right? So there's not that many translations out there, um, as many as people think, but they're taking uh, a standard translation like the NASB or the Old Christian Standard or something like that, and they're, then they're adding footnotes and commentary and devotionals in there related to a certain subject. Um, but that's a misperception by people outside of Christianity. So having just one translation probably increased perception of the reliability of Scripture. Uh, and it conveyed a sense of majesty, right? When you read the King James, there's something... It's a beautiful translation, and there's something that's majestic about it, something that's kind of otherworldly, um, that it, it sounds like. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that's not actually really an accurate um, of the Greek and Hebrew, um, but the fact that it's Old English, and so it, it does sound kind of otherworldly to us. In fact, the King James was already in archaic English by the time it came out in 1611, uh, because the King James was based on other translations. Uh, we'll get to that in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so the first, so the, understand the King James Bible was not the first English translation. You had 
Uh, the Tyndale Bible came out in 1526, at least in the New Testament. He didn't get it finished because he got killed. Um, that's what happens when you criticize the king uh, for his annulment of uh, the capital of Aragon. Uh, so Tyndale was strangled and then burned at the stake. Uh, the Great Bible in 1539, the Geneva Bible in 1560, and the Bishop's Bible in 1568. All those came before the King James, and the King James was actually a revision of the Bishop's Bible. So the King James translators did not start from scratch. They started with the Bishop's Bible and were only making changes where they needed to. Uh, and so some of the English in the King James Bible is even predates 1611. It really goes back to the, the 1500s. Um, so you're talking about English that is 500 years old. And when the King James translation was made, the intention was to get it into the language of the common person, uh, what they call the plowboy. Uh, now, we would probably, you know, not, we don't have too many plowboys around here anymore, so we'd probably say the man on the street, um, or in the words of the guy who helped birth the NIV, the man in the hotel. The guy who helped bring about the NIV was witnessing to a man in a hotel lobby and was just quoting scripture to him, and the man's becoming red-faced, and eventually he just burst out laughing. And the guy's like, what? And he's like, you know, this is, sounds funny, you know, and it made him realize, okay, we're due for an English, we're due for a new English translation here, so that the language sounds like the language of the common people, um, and that's the intention of, of scripture. It was in, in Greek, as I mentioned before, it was written in Koine Greek. Well, Koine means common, and so the Greek of the New Testament was written in the language of the common people. And in fact, one of the things we found. They did uh, one of the excavations, archaeological digs they did in Egypt. They dug up all these ancient Greek manuscripts, and what they discovered, and these were non, some of it was New Testament stuff they found, but some of it was just, you know, letters or, you know, freights or, you know, just different things from everyday life. And what they discovered was, oh, the Bible was not written in a special, like, holy Greek, ver you know, a holy version of Greek, that the, the, the New Testament was written in a common Greek language of the everyday person. And so there's, we have from the very beginning, you can see the intention of the apostles was to write so that the, the common man could understand what was being said. Um, so back to what we talked about before, the King James is the best Bible. This is an issue of language and this is an issue of manuscripts. So let's talk more about the language first. Um, now this is from the, the preface of the 1611 King James Bible, which if you're really serious about this, I commend to you to read. Uh, get a little difficult because it is 400 year old English. But this, is, this was fascinating. Uh, they, the, the King James translators said this, Now to the latter we answer that we do not deny, nay, we affirm and avow that the very meanest, meaning poorest, translation of the Bible in English set forth by men of our profession, for we have seen none of theirs of the whole Bible as yet, containeth the word of God, nay, is the word of God. So what they're saying here is the king, for people who are King James only, they're holding a position that the translators of the King James Bible themselves did not hold. The, the translators of the King James Bible are saying the worst Bible translation out there the, the, that we have into English does not just contain God's word, it should be considered God's word. They were not saying the King James is the one and done Bible for all English speakers for all time. That was not what they believed. So if you think the NIV, or is the, if you're a King James only person, you believe, well, the NIV is a terrible Bible. Well, according to the King James translators, they said we should still accept it. Um, all right, next slide. Dr. Mark Ward makes the comment, Christianity has consistently had the goal of giving the word of God in their own language. In fact, one of the, one of the first things that Martin Luther did uh, in the Protestant Reformation uh, is after the deed of Worms, he holds away in a, in a German castle and he translates the Bible into German. And that's what fueled the revolution in part, was, or the reformation in part, was people were able to get the scriptures in their own language. There was no longer in the language of Latin that only the priests and the educated could, could access. Getting the language into the language of the common people, the vernacular of the common people, made the Bible accessible to everyone. And that was absolutely essential to the Protestant Reformation. Because the idea was people should not be dependent upon a priest or a bishop to tell you, well, this is what the word of God says. No, you should be able to read it for yourself. You should be able to look for yourself. All right, next slide. Uh, Dr. Mark Ward, he comments uh, on this. And, and Mark Ward grew up loving and using the King James Bible. And if you want to go deeper on this subject, um, so there's two books that I would recommend. But his is probably the one I recommend the most, Authorized, the Use and Misuse of the King James Bible. Uh, Mark Ward has a PhD in New Testament interpretation from Bob Jones University, which that's what's part of what's interesting is because Bob Jones is known for using King James 
version. So he's an insider in a sense. He's not somebody like me who did not grow up in the King James. He grew up on the King James, um, yet offers some insights as to why we really shouldn't be using it as our sole Bible anymore. And the other thing I appreciate about his book is there's no technical knowledge required. You don't need to know any Greek or any Hebrew. He doesn't really get into the manuscript question. He really just deals with the language question. And he's hilarious. Uh, he's just so funny to read. But I, I love this quote here. I mean, the once most beloved Bible translation, known as the Vulgate, that's the Latin translation of the Bible, um, had a much longer and arguably deeper influence on glo global Christianity than the King James Version has had. But it's completely unreadable by most people because most people, according to a recent Gallup polling, do not read Latin. Few Protestants, at least, lament the Vulgate's decline because they see no point in keeping Christian bookshelves stocked with a Bible that's completely unreadable by the people who shop there. So, again, the King James Only Physician begs the question, well, if you're so big on a certain Bible translation, why don't we just go back to the Latin Vulgate? Um, well, you say, well, because people can't read that. And to that, I would say, exactly. And that's the problem with the King James. Uh, next slide. Modern readers quite literally can't not merely don't know what they're missing when they read the King James Version. You can teach people to look up unfamiliar words, but the issue here is not words you know you don't know. It's words and phrases and syntax and punctuation you don't know you don't know. Features of English that have changed in subtle ways rather than dropping completely out of the language. So let's, let's talk about some of these in, uh, as examples. Um, and, and Mark Ward gives this example from his own life personally. Psalm 37, 8, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now, you can give somebody uh, a dictionary. In fact, if you want to really understand the language of the, of the King James, you need the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, so not just any old dictionary is going to be good. You need to get a copy of the Oxford English Dictionary. And is that really our vision for Bible translation, to, to hand a new believer, hey, here's a copy of the Bible, and here's a copy of the Oxford, Oxford English Dictionary. Go to work. And you need to look up every word um, as you're reading. Because in the King James, one out of every five words has either changed in meaning or dropped out of English usage. One in five. Can you imagine? I mean, who wants to read their Bible like that? That every fifth word you're having to look up. But the problem is you don't even know which words to look up sometimes. And it's not just words, it's also just, like he says, syntax and phrases. Because you can look up, okay, what does fret not thyself in any wise to do evil mean? Mark Ward said he doesn't know. And he was at a camp, uh, a summer camp, where they everybody memorized the King James Version. That was the only Bible they used because that was what some churches preferred. And so just to, for the sake of unity, that's all they used. And he, he estimated about 10,000 people over the course of the summer memorized this verse. And from talking to counselors and pastors and students, all of them, nobody could tell them what that meant. Um, and you can look up every word individually, right? Fret, not, thyself, in, any, wise, to, do, evil. You can look up every single one of those words, but that still doesn't tell you what does this phraseology mean, in any wise. What does that mean? We don't speak that way. I don't know what that means. I think, you know, modern translation says something to the fact of, like, you know, don't worry, it leads only to evil. Okay, well, you know, so worrying leads to evil. Okay, well, that makes sense. I can grasp that. Um, so again, even a dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary, can't rescue you here because it's not just words, it's phrases. Next slide. But words also. So many of the words in the King James are completely out of the English language. I don't even know if I can pronounce these words correctly. Besom, chambering, emerald, firmament. These are words that are no longer used in English, but they're in the King James. And so if you're going to read the King James, you've got to know what they mean. So there's the, now the Oxford English Dictionary can rescue you there. And you'll at least know to look it up. But the really problem is what we call false friends. Words that you think that you know what they mean, but they don't mean what you think they mean because language evolves. Uh, Galatians 1.13, Paul talks about conversation, but what he means by that is way of life. Philippians 4.6, the King James says, you know, something to the effect of, be careful for nothing. Now, what Paul meant was not, don't wear your seatbelt, don't lock your front door at night. That's not what he meant. He means careful meant anxious. Don't be, that's why modern translation says, don't be anxious for anything. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 15 uses the word addicted. Well, that's a, certainly a loaded phrase in our, in our culture today, and it doesn't mean addicted back then. It meant devoted. Mean in Acts 21, 39 could be better translated in modern English as unimportant. So there's a lot of words that you, but if you're reading your Bible, are you even going to know to look these words up if you're just reading the King James? Because you think you know what they mean, but they don't mean what you think they mean. Uh, another example, I didn't have time to put it in the slideshow, but from Elijah, and the confrontation between the prophets of Baal, uh, the, the King James says something about, you know, don't, we, you know, he says to the, the people, when will you stop, you know, halting between 
positions or something like that. And of course, we all know what halting means, you know, halt, right? Well, halting back then didn't mean halt, it meant limp. And so he's saying, hey, when will you, why will you stop limping between two positions? So again, difference in meaning. Those false terms will trip you up. Uh, on a note on this point, if you want to get, if you don't feel like reading the whole book, but you want kind of a Reader's Digest, Mark Ward also made a documentary. It's about 45 minutes long. It's available on Faith Life TV. It doesn't cover as much as the book. I mean, he definitely cut out a lot of stuff. But it's entertaining, and it's short. So if that, you know, you can throw that on while you're on the treadmill or something. Um, I literally was exercising when I watched it. So uh, that's another option for you, too, if you don't want to read the whole book. Um, as Dr. Mark Ward says, objections to the readability of the KJV are not besides the point. They are the point. Again, for those who are um, adamant that we should be reading only the King James, the readability is the point. Now, one of the things King James only people will bring up, again, this is just dealing with the readability, uh, not the language, not the manuscripts. They'll say, well, actually, this is a, this is a false, uh, this is false information. People who think the King James isn't readable, because we run the King James Version through computer readability tests, and it comes out to be an average of a fifth grade level of reading. And you're like, oh, really? Well, let's, let's, let's stop and think about how those computer, um, here's the, the basic problem is computers can't read. Um, they can count. <laughs> There's, computers can do some great stuff, but, but reading as a human reads is not one of them, uh, at least not yet, uh, or at least not the tools that they're using to, to promote the King James. Uh, the, how, so one of the tests, what, the way it works is the tool measures a word's complexity by syllable count, but that's not a reliable way of, of determining whether a word can be understood. I mean, going back to the word besom, well, that's only two syllables, should be easy to understand. I don't know what besom is. I have no idea. It's not a, it's 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 archaic Elizabethan English. We don't use it anymore. Um, word order and syntax plays no role in these reading level analysis analyses. And he showed that by he would take the text and he make, he made, he totally rearranged the word order by alphabetical order. So it was completely nonsense. And you still run it through the computer and you get you know a similar result, maybe even the same result. And typography plays no role in these reading analyses. Um, next slide. As Dr. Mark, Mark Ward says, in fact, it's a little odd that someone would presume to tell numerous Bible readers, no, you can read the King James Version just fine. My computer says so. <laughs> the mere fact that I own a 400-page book called the King James Bible Word Book, a contemporary English of curious and archaic words found in the King James Version of the Bible, suggests rather strongly that the King James is above a fifth grade reading level. Uh, so what reading level is the King James Version on? What? Fifth grade. Fifth, no, it's not in the fifth grade. Shakespeare. Uh, Shakespeare. Well, you're getting a lot closer, actually. Some people will say the 12th grade. They'll say it was the 12th grade reading level. It's actually not of any reading level. Because reading level presumes contemporary English, vernacular English. And so the, the King James, uh, Grace is really accurate. It's not on a, a, a reading level at all because it's not in modern English. It's in Elizabethan English. And so it's not on a reading level. Now, what would the reading level be for the Elizabethan age? Maybe it would be a fifth grade level. Maybe you had fifth grade back then. But it's, it's comparing apples and oranges. You can't do that. Um, it's not in contemporary English. So it's, it's really nonsensical to talk about the reading level. It's kind of like saying, what is the reading level of Finnish? Uh, you know, well, to, to all of us, it, it doesn't matter whether you know, it's, it's, it's not on the fifth grade level, it's not on the 12th grade level, it's not on the 86 year old level. I mean, it's like there's no level for that, right? We don't speak Finnish. Well, I mean, I don't know, if you do, that's great, but probably none of us speak Finnish, I'm guessing. Uh, so it's just not, that's just really not helpful to think in those terms. All right. All right, now let's talk about the manuscripts a little bit. Uh, and just like, I guess, my, my classic disclaimer, as I've said, I think only as every lecture, I am just doing a survey of this topic. Wow, we could spend hours and hours talking about this. I don't feel like I'm doing the subject justice, but I'm hoping that it's helpful to give you a cursory look at the, the, the questions. And for those of you who have time and interest, you can go deeper um, and go in, and look more in depth. But for those of you who don't have time, because we can't all study everything, right? This is why we, we rely on experts uh, in, in, in every walk of life. Um, that this will at least be helpful in giving you some, some edu basic education on the subject. And you'll have something to say when you hear one of these arguments or something comes up. So let's talk about the manuscripts. 
So what will happen, um, again, as I said before, when the King James was translated, they didn't have access to very many manuscripts. The, the amount of manuscripts we've had since the time of King James has massively increased. Uh, what you'll find is some, a lot of times, and this is what Ripplinger did in her book, the Million Bible Versions, and I actually just earlier this year, a church member sent me something that she got saw on Facebook that somebody had posted. Uh, and so this is what the King James Almighty people will love to do, is they will post um, a comparison of, okay, here's a verse from the King James, and here's a verse from like the NIV or a modern trend or NASB or ESV or something, and look, see something's different, something's been changed, or something's been deleted. So therefore, the modern translation is wrong. Now, what is implicit in that comparison? That the older one was right the first time. That the King James is right. The King James is right. The King James is the basis for all, tra it's the standard, it's the comparison point. But what should be the comparison point? The original, the original manuscripts, what Paul actually wrote, what Matthew actually wrote. That's the standard that every Bible translation should be compared against. That's what we care about. Um, is what the original said. Now, there are some people who would hold to an extreme version of King James only who they believe that basically God gave the Bible a second time. It was a second inspiration uh, at the time of the translators. And they'll say, if something in the King James doesn't match up with a Greek manuscript, well, the Greek should be changed. Like, that's hard to, to reason with, um, that kind of extreme uh, view of uh, basically a re-inspiration of the Bible, but again, all I can say is that the King James Version translators themselves did not hold to that. Um, okay, so, um, but yeah, let's go back. Uh, the, so the basis for comparison is always what the original said. And as I've said previously with under textual criticism is, it's not that we lost the Bible over time. God has preserved his word. Um, Ironically, interestingly, through having thousands of copies, all which have some errors in them, God has preserved his inerrant word. Uh, because nobody can change the Bible uniformly for everybody. Nobody can just insert something conspiracy theory-wise. The Bible has become incorruptible by the fact that it's spread out. But what that means is over time, as mistakes have been made, some errors have been added, what we have is a 105% Bible. So it's not that we've lost some of the Bible, it's that we've gained some extra along the way that we need to shave off. When we're, when we're looking at the manuscripts, we want to say, hey, what's the original say? Because that's what I want. I don't really want what a scribe inserted. I don't want a mistake that was added. I want just what the original author said. And I do want to say this. I don't hope I'm not coming across too harsh on the King James only position. Because a lot of these people, their, their, their desire, their motivation is there's a passion and a zeal for the purity and protection of God's word, and I commend that, uh, and, and I and I and I share that. I share that that's very same feeling. You know, I'm I am basing my eternal destiny on what the Bible says, so it matters to me very much that the Bible is preserved. It matters to me that we have an accurate copy of the Bible. So I, I share that passion. So so if someone in a King James only position, I would say, hey, I I I, I share your passion for the the protection of God's word. But let's look at the evidence of how he did that. Because again, we I want just what the apostles wrote. I don't want anything extra that got added in along the way. Okay, now there's no way I can look at all the examples. Um, but I want to pick out a few that are the main ones. Uh, before, we, but before I do that, let me preface, as I've said before, when people get really worked up about this, and the King James only people are like, oh, you know, there's, our Bible's been corrupted, it's been changed. You need to ask them, what doctrine has been changed? What, so all these differences you're talking about, what doctrines of Christianity are in danger based on the Bible translations? Because the truth is, there's not. Like, the deity of Christ, it's all over a modern English translation. Uh, and, and we'll look at one example for that. Um, the resurrection, the, 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 the atoning sacrifice of Jesus, all of these things are preserved in a modern English translation. So th this conspiracy theory idea that they're taking away um, the heart of Christianity, is just, it's just not true. There's no major doctrine of Christianity that is affected by a textual variant. Um, the only one that I know of is actually would be snake handling, uh, because the, the longer ending of Mark talks about handling snakes. Now, even if it, if, and if it is original, which I don't think it was, but if it was even, 
would point out it doesn't command you to hold to, to handle snakes. It just mentions it. Um, but it's tragic. I mean, there's still churches where this is being practiced, where people are handling snakes, and, and occasionally you hear about people dying from this. Uh, and it's I read one uh, one story. It's just it was it's it just so tragic. The father died from snake handling, and then several years later, the son died from snake handling. And you're like, this is terrible. I mean, like we're just not learning here. Um, and, and that's tragic, and that's based on something that's probably not even original to scripture. Um, but apart from that, I don't know of any doctrine that's affected by these differences. And why it's important to understand these differences is because when you come across, across the liberal uh, critics and the liberal New Testament scholars who are claiming the Bible's corrupt, can't be trusted, look, there's all these changes, like, like, the, like the Bart Ehrmans of the world, they're able to use these half-truths about changes in the Bible, changes in manuscripts, and they're, and they're able to lead people astray, out of, lead people away from faith and Christianity, based on those half-truths. So this is why it's really important. We need to be talking about these things. We need to be honest and upfront about, hey, here are some passages that are suspect in our Bible because people who are unfamiliar with this at all, they, they go to college, they come, they go to take a, you know, they're required to take some sort of freshman Bible class or something like that, and they get a scholar who presents one side and, and part of the evidence, but not all of it, and their world is shaken. And they think, oh, I can't trust my Bible. The Bible has been corrupted. And I guess, you know, everybody else is just deceived. Um, not being aware that, yeah, pastors know about these things, but generally we're dealing with other things, you know, teaching and preaching and marriage counseling and, and, and family can, family counseling. And so, but it's important sometimes to hit the pause button and say, we need to talk about these things so people aren't having their faith shook. So when a book like Misquoting Jesus comes out and it's a New York Times bestseller, people are like, oh, I guess I can't trust the Bible. Um, uh, these first two are the biggest ones, and that's why I want to include them. And also, one of the things that happens with the going back to the textual criticism conversation is they'll textual the, the people, the liberal scholars, the the the, the bad uh, skeptic uh, skeptical tour guides, as I, I call them, they'll point to a passage like this and say, "Look, this isn't actually original Bible, and, and here's why." And what they then want you to come to is so that's true, probably, but then they want to lead you to a false conclusion that well, you can't trust the whole Bible. The whole Bible is just not trustworthy. Well, that's not the case. Like they brought, I saw one video online that was talking about these first two, Mark 16 and John 7, and and the 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 intonation was, the implication was, see, because of these things, you you know, there's probably all these other problems in the Bible. When there's not, um, and I'm like, you just brought up the number, the two biggest uh, areas that are disputed, and so, but it leads people to a false conclusion that oh, like well, I guess the whole record is suspect. The whole thing's not reliable. Uh, and even for, uh, so that the King James translation was based widely on the work of the Greek New Testament by a scholar named Erasmus. And what's interesting is he knew about the stuff. So even, even 1500, even, sorry, even 500 years ago, he was aware of uncertainty with the Mark and John passage. Uh, Dr. Peter Williams comments, um, these two passages might seem to cast doubt on the text of the Gospels as a whole, but I would argue that they in fact have the opposite effect. Though Erasmus produced his first edition of the Greek Gospels using just two manuscripts, we know that he knew about the uncertainty attached to these two passages. His manuscript, number one, told him of the uncertainty of, at the end of Mark and also admitted the passage in John. In other words, the most learned man on earth, that's what Erasmus was considered at the time, the most learned man on earth in the 16th century would not have been surprised by any discovery in the last five centuries that have called these verses into question. In fact, doubts about them have been known to anyone who took care to investigate during the last 1,600 years. So William's point is, if, if Erasmus knew there was serious questions about Mark 16 and John 7 500 years ago, and he only had two manuscripts, it's good evidence, again, that the, actually the text on the whole is reliable, that the things that, that have been are suspect were already known. And, and this was suspect, 1 John 5, 7 and 8, the... That was suspect for Erasmus, too. I'll talk about that here in a second in detail. So, again, the fact that we can pinpoint where there are serious doubts that this is actually supposed to be in the Bible highlights the fact that there's a whole section that we don't have in doubt, that it's reliable. Um, but again, they'll lead you to a false conclusion. They're, lead, they're wanting people to look at those things and say conspiracy theory, you can't trust your whole Bible, when it should lead us to, when, when another scholar is, is saying this, actually points us in the opposite direction, it points us to the reliability of the Bible, because if we can know 
where the suspect passengers are, what that implies, what that means is we also know where there are not suspect passengers. All right, so let me look at a few of these. Uh, and again, just to clarify, I believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I, will, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Um, inerrancy rests, though, in the autographs, what Paul wrote, what Matthew wrote, what John wrote. That is where inerrancy lies. Um, I'll come back to that thought here in a second. Um, Mark 69, 9 through 20. Um, can somebody read verse 8, 16, 8 for us? I totally forgot to grab the Bible. Here, somebody have the Bible down here, Bill? Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, what, read Mark 16, 8 for us. They went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Okay, so Mark just ends there. If that's the ending of Mark, it just ends very abruptly. And in fact, it's, it's almost jarring. If you think of the book actually ending there, it's kind of like jarring, like, what? That's it? What do you mean they didn't tell anybody? Uh, so they're just afraid because they're terrified of the, the empty tomb and they just don't tell anybody? It's very jarring. Uh, well, first off, that's not the only book in the Bible that has a very abrupt, jarring ending. ending. Can somebody think of another one? Jonah. Jonah! Yeah, I mean, Jonah just ends. And there's no resolution. There's no, well, did Jonah repent? Did Jonah, you know, you know, admit that God was right? You know, there's no, it just ends. And it's very literary, from a literary perspective, it's very powerful, right? And I think, and I'm borrowing from a friend of mine from many years ago uh, who made this observation. She made this argument in a college paper, and I think she might be on to something. Uh, and Daniel Wallace, who's one of the world's Greek, leading Greek scholars, and especially the, old, uh, the manuscripts may seem to agree with this position, that it's a literary effect. Because if you end with just this, okay, well, they, they, they fled from the empty tomb, they didn't tell anybody, what rises in the heart of the believer is like, well, I gotta tell somebody. Like people need to know Jesus rose from the dead. This is the biggest news of the, in the history of the world. We need to tell people about this. And so there's something in it that I think has an, a, a literary effect on its reader to to compel them to share the gospel. Um, now, so is Mark 16 9 through 20 then added on because people were uncomfortable with the shorter ending? Was it added on? Um, possibly, yeah, quite possibly. I think it was. Um, Criswell, if any of you guys are, anybody watching or part of this familiar with Criswell, one of the famous Baptist preachers, he held to the shorter ending of, of Mark. Um, so some reasons why. Well, it's missing, from the very, it's missing from various old and reliable Greek manuscripts. It's also missing from numerous early translations into Latin, Syriac, Armenian, and Georgian. No, not that Georgia, um, the other Georgia. Um, early church leaders like Origen and Clement of Alexandria appear to have not known about those verses. And it's just different. If you, if the Greek scholars will tell us that the Greek words are different, um, uncommon to Mark, that there's stylistic differences in the Greek, that it just doesn't seem to match the rest of the book. So there's a pretty good chance that it's not original. But there's, there's also, it is in a lot of manuscripts, and so there's a possibility it should be included. And so most translations, most modern translations, in an effort to be transparent, and honest will, will include that, but they'll usually add some brackets or something that says, you know, the earliest manuscripts don't contain this. Um, again, now, if it is original, does it change anything? Theologically, no. If it's not there, then there's one left, that then you lose the verse to support snake handling. Um, and again, it's not commanding snake handling, right? It's just um, commenting on protection. So um, let's move on for time's sake. How many of we're running out of time, okay? I gotta move faster. So John 7, 53 through 8, 11. Uh, this seems to be even more suspect than the ancient ending of John. This is the woman caught in adultery that's brought before Jesus, and uh, you know, say, well, should we stone her? And Jesus is just like, you know, writing or drawing on the ground. He says, let the one who's without sin cast the first stone. Um, it's a favorite story of many people, um, but it's got some problems. Namely, it's absent from all of the oldest manuscripts. It's not in any of them. What also makes it seem really suspect is where it is included, the, the, the manuscripts where we do find it, it moves around. It's not always in the same location, and one manuscript even puts it in Luke, not in John. So that right there is a red flag. That there's, something, there's something suspect about this verse. Uh, some also think if you, read the, if you read John and you just jump from 752 to 812 that it actually flows better, that this is an interruption of the flow, so an internal argument. Again, whether it's original or not, it really doesn't change anything theologically. Um, I, I know one of my Greek professors, or one of my, sorry, one of my New Testament professors, Dr. William Cook, his theory was because it appears in so many places, he thought this was probably an oral tradition. This probably did actually happen, but it was not included in John. John didn't actually write it. 
but it was a, it was an oral tradition that got passed down, and so at some point got inserted. <clears throat> okay, First John five seven through eight, and this is a, a passage that talks and it kind of makes the Trinity more explicit. Now, if you know me at all, you know that I am a huge proponent of the Trinity. I see it all over the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. So certainly would not be against a verse that uh, confirms the Trinity. Um, but the problem with this this verse. Compare a King James to a, to a modern English translation is there's no sure evidence of this reading in any Greek manuscript until the 1500s. Like so, I mean, so you're going over a thousand years, and there's no Greek manuscripts that have the Greek that the King James is based on. So if you believe that the King James got it right, that the Greek the Greek underlined the King James got it right you really believe something very radical and, in my mind, scary about the reliability of the Bible. You believe that a verse can drop out of Scripture completely for over a thousand years and then show up again. Well, that sounds like the Joseph Smith translation, right? Um, that just a verse can just show up out of nowhere that's, that's been missing. Um, so that's very concerning. And how it ended up in originally... I, uh, as the story goes, Erasmus was not going to include it in the Greek New Testament, and, and, but he made some comment about the because he didn't have it, and the, 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 what he was working with did not have it. He made some comment to the effect of, well, if you show me a Greek manuscript that has it, I'll put it in. Well, somebody produced a Greek manuscript and had it in, and it's quite likely that was made for the very purpose of putting it in. Um, we can't prove that, but again, it's very suspect. Nothing wrong with the verse, as far as I know. It's, it's orthodox, but it was probably a teaching you know, based on those verses that somebody made the verse a, a note, um, but it's not original to what John wrote. All right, next example. Um, and, and there's lots of these we can look at, but I just want to hit maybe some of the big ones. So uh, some people have called, some of the King James only people have called the, the New International Version the bloodless Bible. Anybody heard that before? Oh, good. That's good. Well, where that comes from is based on one verse, because <laughs> like, you know, I read my modern English translation, and it talks about the blood of Jesus all over the place. So where are you getting that? And they got it from one place. And this is classic of what happens in the King James, of how they'll, they'll make a really big deal about a verse. And the, but the point is, like, well, the thing you're making a, di a deal about, that there's ten other verses that confirm this truth. So the fact that it's, if this is a conspiracy theory to remove the blood of Jesus from uh, you know, his propitiatory atonement out of, uh, out of Scripture, then it's a really badly executed conspiracy because it's all over any modern English translation. Um, so it's really it's really an inaccurate argument. But both, so they'll point to this, Colossians 1.14, in the, in the King James, it says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Um, a modern translation like the ESV says, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, so you understand, if you look at the underlying Greek here, uh, it's virtually, I don't remember right, it's, Exactly the same, actually, even though, um, no, I'm sorry, that's the next slide I'll show you. So, um, sorry, hold that thought. Yeah, so the Greek is, yeah, the Greek is the exact same as we use. It's just in the, there's this expression by his blood that's in the Greek manuscripts that the King James is based off of. So how did this happen? Why do we think that the through his blood is not original um, to the text? Well, again, we look at the, the manuscript evidence for it, and it's not there in the, the in a lot of the manuscripts, and so there's strong evidence from textual criticism that it's not original. But so then you say, where did it come from? Uh, well, first of all, just the idea, going back to that they took out the blood of, of Jesus out of the Bible, look at Colossians 1.20. So just a few verses later, in a modern English translation, it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So again, if they're trying to remove the blood from the Bible, they've done a very bad job. I mean, six verses later, even, it's there. So why do these, where... Where do these things come from? Well, look, look, compare these verses. This is what probably happened here. And this kind of gets you into a game, gives you a little taste of how textual criticism works. Uh, and there are books out there. Even, again, you don't have to know Greek. You can read some of these books. Uh, I think Bruce Metzger's book, Textual Criticism Commentary in the New Testament, uh, talks about, about various passages and, and talks about how the translation committee came to their decisions. So the King James, the Ephesians 1, 7, the ESV, in whom, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Colossians 1, 14, again for us, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Uh, now, ignore the second part of verse 7 there, according to the riches of his grace. 
the Greek between, now I know it says in whom here it says in him there, it's the exact same word in, in Greek. So this part, the first part, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in whom in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. The Greek is exactly the same, except for the word trespasses and sins. Those are two different words in Greek. So it's the exact same in Greek. So now what happens, so if you're a scribe and you're copying this passage, um, and, and you've maybe you've just recently copied Ephesians, which would even make sense, right? Because Ephesians maybe came before uh, in the Bible you were copying, and you get to Colossians, and you're very familiar with Ephesians. How, if the Greek is the exact same, how easy would it be to insert that phrase through his blood into Colossians? Because you're familiar with this verbiage. Maybe you've even memorized Ephesians. In him we have redemption through his blood. And so when you get to in whom we have redemption, maybe unco unconsciously you even just tag in there through his blood. Um, so it's, it's what we call parallelism, where we have two passages that are very similar, and a scribe knowingly or unknowingly made them align. That's probably what happened here of why that expression through his blood got into Colossians 1.14 that probably came from Ephesians 1.7. All right, uh, do I have any more examples in there? Yeah, so um, Karm, it's a great resource online. They, their comment on this passage says, the most ancient manuscripts do not contain the phrase through his blood in Colossians 1.14. The vast majority of all Greek manuscripts, even those in the Byzantine tradition, which is the manuscript family favored by King James Onius, do not contain these words in this particular verse. And it's not only modern translators who acknowledge this. The old Wycliffe Bible, Wycliffe Bible, sorry, which came before the King James, says, in whom we have again bind and remission of sins. So the Wycliffe Bible didn't include it. And that predated the King James. The words are also absent in the ancient translations like the Latin, Coptic, and Syriac. So the manuscript evidence and the ancient translation evidence would strongly favor that this is not original. And again, I just want what, what Paul actually wrote. All right, next one. Uh, now, what King James only people don't often bring up is there's many places where a modern translation would actually um, make it more explicit that Jesus is God. Um, and one of the examples of this is Titus 2.13. In the King James, it reads, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the, of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Now, that could read like we're talking about two separate persons, right? You've got the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Right? It sounds like you could read that as that's two separate persons. But modern translations, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It makes it very clear that God and Savior are both Jesus. And the reason why the divinity of Jesus is more explicit in a modern translation is because we've learned more about Greek grammar. Uh, our understanding of Greek grammar has improved since the time that the King James was translated. And if I'm remembering correctly, and I could get this totally wrong, so please don't quote me on this, but it's based on um, the idea when you've got one article in Greek and then two nouns, uh, there's this something that is called Caldwell Canon, if I'm remembering correctly, that it, it's showing that, the, that both the nouns are referring to the one individual, one person. And so the Greek grammar, we better understand its noun to be referring both great God and Savior. Those are both referring to Jesus. Okay, so let's look at the damage report. What do we what is the King James only controversy brought? Well, it's brought a lot of needless division among Christians. Um, I, I, it was painful. It was I was I felt it was pain one uh, several years ago. Somebody showed up at the church here on a, a weekday and they're like, you know, we're you know, I guess they're new to town or whatever. They're like, we're looking for a you know a church where the gospel's preached. And he goes, you guys preach the gospel here? I'm like, well, yeah, we preach the gospel here. Well, what Bible translation do you use? <laughs> you got, you know, Darren's like, well, I use the NASB. I'm like, well, Jeff and I are like, we use the ESV. And they're like, and his response, it was almost like, he's like, well, thanks for being honest. And, and they were gone. And it was like, wow, at least you're admitting that you're a false teacher. You know, and it, was, it was kind of almost the, the intent. And it just was so painful. It's like, I felt like you're looking like at me like I'm a false Christian, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a false teacher because of the Bible translation I'm using. And uh, again, it brings a lot of division among Christians where they think, oh, this church is corrupt or this church isn't really following the gospel. Um, need, it, it brought much needless division among Christians, which distracts us from the real threats and the real enemy. Uh, 
And it consumes time and energy that could have gone into sharing the gospel. It could have gone into serving the poor. It could have gone into doing good works. And, uh, you know, I mean, volunteer in your local school. Help some kid learn to read. Uh, you know, how much energy has gone into this conversation? Uh, and it's very draining for pastors. Again, it's come up twice. I've had to deal with it at least twice as a pastor. Um, somebody confused about this. And it confuses Christians. It makes them think, oh, maybe my Bible's not trustworthy. Maybe there's this big conspiracy theory. And ultimately, here's, here's my, biggest, my biggest issue, though, with the King James Only movement. It keeps people from understanding God's word. And, and in fact, I think this is why. I think it's really a satanic strategy to have many people say, oh, you should only, you only read the King James Bible. Because it keeps people from really understanding the word of God. And that's what God's word was intended to be read and understood in the vernacular. Um, and for many people... The King James is a barrier to that. They pick up a King James Bible, and it's like me reading King Lear and Shakespeare, and I'm just going to miss a lot. I'm not going to get everything that's there. It's going to be hard to read. It's going to be slow to read. Um, it's not going to. I'm going to be disinclined to read it. Um, I think the King James movement is it, is really a way of keeping people from God's word, um, which is the exact opposite of what we want. What is the best English Bible? That's a, probably a pretty good question to ask. Um, let Mark Ward speak to that question here. Um, he talks about his quest to choose one English Bible. He says, I also couldn't choose one English Bible translation because while I was on a quest for the best, I was also continually discovering the usefulness of all major English translations. If I did land on one translation as my favorite, whatever that meant, what was I going to do? Cut myself off from the insight into God's word that I kept receiving over and over from other translations? Um, he talks about the, the value of multiple translations. And it's okay to have a preferred translation. I prefer the English Standard Version for multiple reasons. But there's lots of great Bible translations out there. And, and when I'm studying a passage in depth, it's great to look at different translations. Look at the NIV. Look at the NASB. Look at the ESV. Look at the NET. Yes, look at the King James. Look at the New King James. Um, I Look at the Lexham English Bible. That's become something I've really found helpful. It's a not a very well-known translation, but I've really found the Lexham English Bible uh, the LEV, very helpful when I'm comparing passages. And the great thing about like, comparing multiple passages is even if you don't know a word of Greek or Hebrew, you'll start to get a sense generally of where the, uh, the translation uh, dilemmas lie by looking at different translations. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible is another one I use. Um, so we are so blessed. I mean, many cultures, many languages, they only have the, the Bible and there's only one translation of it. Um, and, and unfortunately, there's still thousands of languages where there's no translation of the Bible. But as English speakers, we just enjoy this incredible wealth um, of translation translations available to us. So take advantage of that. Use that as you're studying a passage in depth uh, to, to look at different translations and benefit from that. Again, can we? could you make arguments for a preferred translation? Sure. And that's kind of outside the scope of, of today's lecture. But what, regardless of what your preferred translation is, don't don't um, deny yourself the riches of being able to use multiple translations uh, to study to study the scriptures. Okay, some final warnings. Um, one, the message uh, the message can be helpful. I'm not saying don't read the message, but do be aware there's a difference between a translation and a paraphrase. And so the message is really kind of on the more extreme end of a paraphrase. Uh, Eugene Peterson did this. And uh, again, it can be helpful to look at the text in a fresh way, but it's so, it's so much a paraphrase of the word, it's really not a translation anymore. So I would not rely on that for my, my in-depth Bible study or, or memorization, um, but use it as a tool as a paraphrase. Um, and finally, there's, there's a new, they call it a translation, the Passion Translation has come out recently. Have you heard of that? Um, it's not a translation. It would probably be more of a paraphrase, and it's bad. So that's the, the, short, the short commentary on that is I would not recommend using that. Um, uh, 
Of course, I would also not recommend using the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witness uh, translation, because it's uh, it's just corrupt. They, they, they don't accurately translate things, um, but they translate things that fit their, their theology. So, all right, with that said, I think we'll say goodbye to our online world. If you have questions, then we'll open it up for questions here. So.